So uh, I'm Rob Hawks, um, here to talk to you today a little bit about sort of HTML5 gaming, sort of give you a, an overview about what it's all about, what's going on, what kind of technologies you should be looking at, um, and just sort of a general sort of feel for, for the sort of the gaming on the web. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I work for Mozilla, I'm a technical evangelist there. Um, so it's my job to sort of engage with developers and sort of talk about the cool new technologies that are sort of on the web. Um, so we had a few sort of problems um, just now, uh, probably my fault. Um, I've also been up since 4 a.m. because I found out my university results this morning and I couldn't go back to sleep afterwards. Um, so I found out I got a first class in my degree, which is quite interesting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, obviously not a first class in Keynote, but hey. Um, so, but I digress. All of this is cool. Um, but I'm really, really interested in HTML5 and in my job, in my hobby, at university, whatever. Um, I have a slight addiction to it. Um, I like experimenting with code, um, particularly if it involves sort of visual stuff. Um, if you doubt my addiction to HTML5, this is a pie my girlfriend made for me um, with the HTML5 logo on it. Um, I call it HTML5. Um, <laughs> it was really nice. It was chicken and leek. It was very tasty. And I'm, I'm glad she made that for me. But anyway. so. Um, Gaming is something I've been into sort of most of my life. I, I can't remember not being involved in games. So the first sort of games was like ZX Spectrum games. Um, so I was playing things like Paperboy, and it took bloody ages to load on like the cassette and make that funny noise. Um, and then moving on to things like Snares with like Bomberman, that was really interesting, and Mega Drive with um, Sonic. Um, and then I sort of moved on to the PC throughout that time, um, sort of dabbled with things like SimCity, which I was addicted to. Um, other things like Mega Race. Um, don't know, anyone remember Mega Race? It was great fun. Um, and then I sort of moved on to multiplayer games. Um, so Doom wasn't necessarily multiplayer, but there was a version of it that I was playing in my dad's internet cafe, which was multiplayer. And, and that was great. It was like 30 people in the same room just playing Doom. Um, and I was like a kid at the time. It was, it was awesome. Um, but what I'm getting here, at here is gaming is sort of part of my life as I grew up, and it's part of everyone else's life, I think, as well, um, most other people at least. And it's fun to play these kind of games, and they're also really fun to make. Um, I also have to apologize for the fonts. That's screwed up as well. So the time is now really to sort of um, start making games on the web. And we're sort of at a threshold um, where we can create some really cool and interesting games with the technologies that we used to use to make websites. Um, but before I sort of carry on with that, I just want to like, there's some notable events that sort of have justified and, and have been quite interesting related to HTML5 gaming. Um, so one of these was there recently there's been some quite a lot of funding for HTML5 games, um, which I haven't really seen before. And it's sort of something that's been needed because there hasn't been, uh, the kind of games being created are sort of indie games, sort of one developer just screwing around, sort of experimenting with stuff. And, the funding is sort of needed, I think, to sort of justify the, the time and effort it's going to take to make some really, really cool games that are going to really make this technology worthwhile. Um, sort of related to that is like acquisitions of um, HTML5 gaming engines. So um, Zynga bought the Aves engine, uh, and Disney bought the Rocket Pack engine. Um, so these are two really sort of interesting engines that cropped up. And before they even got released to the public, they got snapped up and used for Farmville. Um, so there's other things, like there's uh, the first large-scale um, HTML5 gaming conference, which is in September in Poland. Um, it's called On Game Start. And it's kind of interesting to see that you can get enough people together to talk about and to uh, learn about these technologies. Um, there's obviously something, some interest there. So I think that's a really good thing. Um, and there's actually, I found out the other day, another one in San Francisco uh, in November um, called uh, New, I forgot it written down here, uh, New Game. So that's the 1st and 2nd of November, I think, something like that. So that would be really interesting. Um, and another random thing, Facebook are getting involved in um, game performance, HTML5 game performance. They're not making games, but they're just really interested in finding out how to sort of better the performance of this technology. And I think that's a fantastic thing to sort of, uh, for someone to be doing, especially a company like that. So why is HTML5 gaming so cool? Well, it's because it's using the technologies that we normally use um, in every day, sort of creating web websites, um, behavioral scripts on, on websites. And we can use those now to create browser games. We're not using really anything new here. Um, it's just 
looking at the technologies in a different way. And just to clarify, by HTML5, I mean HTML and JavaScript. It's just, it'll take too, too long to say that every single time. Um, but it's cool because you can, you can write it once and use it anywhere. So um, if you're developing on an iOS uh, device and you, you're creating a game just for that device, you're going to either have to sort of write your code very carefully or you're going to have to rewrite it again um, for another platform. With HTML5, you can, it's just JavaScript and HTML, you can write it once. How true is that? Yeah. What, that you can write it once and use it anywhere? Exactly. Uh, it's as long as there's a browser on that device, it will work fine. I mean, it's, in an ideal world, if all the browsers supported the same technologies, it would be write once, use anywhere. But what I mean by this is just you're using the same, you're the same languages okay. um, across platforms. So, yeah, you also have V8, so you can run JavaScript in the back end. Yeah, uh, is it on the iOS or? No, you can run it on Linux. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like Christine was saying, um, there is, there's going to be sort of um, variances in like the, the way they display on different devices and stuff like that, but you can use CSS, different types of JavaScript for like the, uh, the controls where you've got touchdown events rather than mouse down events. But the majority of your code will probably be, be fine to use across platform. Um, I'm not saying it's perfect. Just saying it's easier, probably. Do you have a question? Or? No, OK. <laughs> so another thing, sort of kind of related, is there's no compilation as well. So it's, it's kind of like a, a hacky language. You can sort of just put something together really quickly. You can look at the source code. You can learn things from what other people have done. It's really uh, uh, sort of quick to sort of test stuff and just use it and just get up to speed of it. And I, I like the rapid nature of this kind of this technology. And it's <coughs> kind of why I started creating games in it. Um, and it's lightweight small text files, you're just using images and stuff like that. It's not taking too much room. Um, but it's open, and I think that's one of the most important things. It gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling about using it. It's just anyone can look at your code. And, and this is also um, a negative, and I'll get, I'll get into this in a second. Um, but that's one of the reasons why I like using it. Um, so it's not all rosy. Um, like I said, there's some reasons why you might not want to use HTML5 for gaming. Um, I'm not advocating that you should replace absolutely everything with this technology. Um, so I just want to cover like two of the sort of main issues, I think. Um, one of these is, oh, you can see how the font screwed up. That should say full support. Um, so not every browser supports every single aspect of HTML5. And particularly sort of cross mobile platforms and de desktop platforms, this is quite prominent. Um, so for example, uh, Canvas isn't supported out of the box by IE9, uh, sorry, anything below IE9. Um, you can sort of install something called Explorer Canvas or other sort of add-ons that replicate Canvas functionality, but it's not going to be quite the same. Um, so you need to be aware of things like that. Um, Web sockets, which we'll talk about in a second as well, sort of multiplayer communication. Uh, it's not supported on um, IE yet at all. Um, or on Android, um, which is interesting because it's supported on iOS, so there's no Web socket support on one of the mobile devices. Um, again, you can fake this using flash sockets and stuff like that, but it's just being aware that some of these technologies aren't fully supported yet. Um, and also WebGL, which is like 3D uh, graphics, um, is also not supported in IE, um, Safari, or Opera. Um, they are looking into it. There are development versions of it, but this isn't publicly available fully yet. So you just need to be aware of these kinds of things. Um, another thing is there's, related to what I was saying about with the open stuff, is there's no DRM. Um, but these technologies weren't built for that. They're, they're built to be open. They're built not to be compiled. They were, you're meant to look at the source code. You're meant to play around with it, whatever. Um, so there's nowhere really for the DRM to go, in, in my opinion. Um, and I kind of like this because I like reading the code. I like looking at how, how someone else has made a HTML5 multiplayer game and, and seeing how that differs from what I've done, whether I can improve, whatever. Um, you can still like um, obfuscate your code or minify it and kind of works, but it's not a, a solution. You can still sort of unminify it, whatever. So you can still, you need to be aware that if you use these kind of technologies, people are going to look at your code. And, and this can be uh, an issue when you're doing multiplayer, because people can cheat. And we'll talk about that um, later on. So some of the technologies involved, I sort of mentioned a few. Um, there's a variety of them, really. I'm going to cover the main ones. So there's Canvas and WebGL. So these are the two sort of big graphics ones. So Canvas is 2D. Um, WebGL uses Canvas, but it's 3D. Um, these are really interesting now. Canvas is, is um, fairly mature. Um, WebGL, I think, I believe, just hit 1.0 in the uh, 
specification, um, but like I said, it's not fully supported everywhere. But it's really quite interesting. It's so fast as well because it's hardware accelerated. Um, so that's the kind of graphics side of stuff. The audio side, you've got HTML5 audio, um, which is great apart from looping. is really crap like, across browsers. Um, I don't know any two browsers that support it the same way. Um, and it's not such a big deal if you're just like playing music in the browser. But if you're doing like a looping sound effect, like a rocket thruster, so you've got like a, a half second noise, and you want that to loop and loop and loop, you, you'll always, not always, in some browsers, you'll get like a very small gap. And it's so noticeable. Um, and at the moment, that has stopped me from using HTML5 audio in my game. Um, but this kind of stuff, it's already being looked into. I think Opera has the most perfect um, uh, implementation of that so far, which doesn't have the gap in. So I'm hoping that that will improve in the future. So there's WebSockets as well. So WebSockets is like the multiplayer communication stuff. So um, this is like a, a bi-directional sort of pipe, I, I suppose. We can sort of send data down and up it real time. Um, you don't have to request the data every time. It just sort of it's there when you need it. Uh, and this is so good for multiplayer games. Um, so if you're using stuff like WebSockets, you're going to need a, a server to sort of pipe it down into. And one of the technologies I really like um, to use on the server is Node.js, um, particularly because it's, it's JavaScript on the server. And I, I just kind of like that because I'm using, um, like I said, with the sort of right ones use anyway, you're, you're using the same language again on the server. So if you're clever, you can write your client-side code and your uh, server-side code sort of using the, the same stuff um, effectively. So you you don't have to rewrite stuff that often. Um, it's just really, really cool. Um, I mean, this is asynchronous. It's event-based. It's kind of interesting. Um, it's got like great third-party modules. So if you want to install WebSocket support, you just like use Socket IO or, or something else. There's loads of options available. And it's such, so easy to install and just get you uh, start using. And you're using a language you already know. Um, so storing data and stuff, that's quite kind of important stuff in games. So on the client side, on the player's computer, you've got like local storage. So um, you can store a certain amount of data there. Um, you can easily sort of add persistence to the game so people can sort of play, make a building, I don't know, lay some farm stuff. Um, and then leave the game, come back, and it's all there. You don't have to save all of that all the time on the server. Um, but if you do want to use the server, again, the font has screwed up here. You've got MongoDB or Redis or stuff like that. So these are, MongoDB is like a document-oriented um, database system, um, like NoSQL, as they call it, whatever. Um, Redis is like a key value store thing, which is stored in memory, um, which is sort of a little bit faster. But whatever, you use whichever one is um, suits your purpose, whether any of these, if any of these do, that's up to you. But these things are, are there. They're supported by nodes, they're whatever. It's, it's just an easy way of um, storing data on the server. So enough about the technologies and stuff. I just wanted to show you some of the existing games, some of my favorite ones that are out there. Um, some of these are, are, I think most of these have been developed sort of as demos. Um, I don't think any of these are, are making huge amounts of money yet, but we'll have a look into them. So one really interesting one um, was uh, some Google guys ported Quake 2. Um, using WebGL, um, WebSockets, so WebGL for the 3D, HTML5 audio for the sound, WebSockets for the multiplayer. So this was a multiplayer version of Quake, um, Quake 2 even. Um, and also local storage for the sort of persistence, um, etc. So, and it, it looks really cool. I mean, it looks like Quake 2, and it, it's playing in your browser, and it's using JavaScript. It's pretty amazing. Um, it's open source. Um, there's a, a sort of a website for it. Um, I'll put these slides up later, just if anyone's asking um, later on, um, with all the links in and stuff like that. So um, it's just Quake 2 Google. If you type that into Google, you'll find it anyway, but whatever. So another one, um, I don't know if has anyone played Minecraft. OK, I've not played it personally myself. I've, I know a few people who are addicted to it. Um, you basically run around in this blocky world, sort of mining stuff and building stuff and uh, avoiding zombies and stuff at night, as far as I know. So it's kind of cool. Um, but anyway, so that Minecraft isn't isn't JavaScript. It isn't on the web. It's um, I don't know what language it actually uses. Does anyone know? Or C, yeah. So I mean, it's desktop stuff. So 
this is actually a, um, a map viewer created in JavaScript using WebGL um, for Minecraft. Um, and it's only a small step to turn this into the actual version of Minecraft, like a, a client to display um, to, to Minecraft, because you run servers and the client sort of connects to it. So you can already see that it, this is how Minecraft looks on the desktop anyway. It's fairly basic. It's blocky. It's kind of a perfect game to sort of port into this WebGL at the moment. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested to see if that goes any further. Um, sort of a bit different, non-3D, um, not even that complicated. It's quite fun. This is Word Squared. Um, has anyone heard of that? It's a cool game. Um, it's massively multiplayer Scrabble. So effectively, it's an unlimited Scrabble game. Um, there is no end to the game. You just continue putting words wherever you want. Um, and it uses uh, WebSockets for the real-time communication stuff. Um, and this is a, you can see it, a map of a very, very small part of the Word Squared universe. And each pixel there, um, probably even less than each pixel, is a tile that someone's laid for a word. Um, and that is a very small part. I, I mean, this goes on forever. Um, and it's never ending. So it's pretty cool. Um, interesting game. It's quite a cool use of the technologies. Um, something. I'm sure quite a few people have played Civilization. So this is a game called FreeCiv, which is an open source version of that. Um, uses Canvas and WebSockets. They're actually um, sort of looking into developing a 3D version of it using WebGL. So this is, um, I think this is a really promising one, particularly because it's actually out there now working. It's fully working. They're not making money of it because it's, it's free and open source, but fine. It's a great implementation of it. Um, this is the kind of stuff not necessarily copies of games. I want to see games as fully featured as this created in HTML5, not just little demos, um, like the kind of stuff I'm making at the, the moment, but proper fully featured games that are really fun and interesting to play and can be extended and what have you. Um, so this is my game. Um, I didn't actually plug the sound in. Can you see that? So the video is a bit crap because um, I actually chose one that it's a bit laggy, but anyway. So this is a multiplayer, massively multiplayer, perhaps just multiplayer game that I've made um, using WebSockets for the sort of communications. That's a bit annoying. And Canvas for the graphics. You basically just shoot your friends in the face with a rocket. Um, and you have like um, the health bar around, which you probably saw the little ring. So if you shoot, you lose a little ring. And if you get shot, you lose your ring as well. So you need to be careful because if you shoot too much, you're going to get picked off really easy. Um, so this is my excuse, really, just to muck around with the HTML5 canvas and WebSockets and stuff. And I advise anyone to just do that. Just make a little game. It's fun. It didn't take too long. The, the complicated stuff are the little details, and you don't have to get that far. Just play around with it. Get used to like things like Node on the server, WebSockets, if you want to do multiplayer. Um, if you just want to do single player, just muck around with Canvas and what have you. Um, it's just a really good way of sort of getting to grips with it rather than jumping in and trying to create something properly crazy straight away. Um, but anyway, so there's, there's more games, loads more games. Um, there's loads of directories, like game directories, um, specifically focused on HTML5, which are out there. Um, there's one called HTML5Games.com. It's got most of the, the interesting games that are out there at the moment. Um, has anyone heard of Congregate? the sort of games repository, yeah. So that is actually now supporting um, HTML5 games, so long as they're submitted through the iframe submission thing. I haven't looked into it too much, but it's kind of cool that that's one of, probably one of the most popular game directories um, for like Flash games and stuff. And it's interesting to see that they're opening their arms up to sort of HTML5. Um, and this is a really fundamental thing to get games popular, is because just Showing them out to developers and stuff is not going to get you very far. If you want to get it out to the general public, you're going to need to go to the, the places where they're already playing the games right now, whether that's Facebook or Congregate or wherever. Um, so just a, a few fundamentals, really, um, about game development. Um, I'm not going to get into the code and stuff. It's not that complicated. You can look into that afterwards if you want. It's mainly just showing you the, the specific parts of the game development stuff that you're going to need to look into. Um, so obviously you've got the main thing, you've got your game loop. So you've got your main thing. Most games will have one of these. Um, it sort of manages all the logic and the animation and the physics and all that kind of stuff. Um, so this is sort of the heart of the game. Um, it's sort of where everything happens. Um, so maybe like something like Word Squared might not um, 
have a game loop because it's it's not using the canvas with the graphics, so you don't need to refresh something every frame. But if you're using canvas with graphics or you're doing physics updates, you might want to use a game update, a game loop even. So sort of related to that, like I said, you've got physics updates, so that's part of a game loop if you want. Um, so if you're like um, using something like Box 2D or um, I'll sort of touch on that in a minute, but any sort of physics updates in your game or you're just doing like simple movement, collision detection, whatever, you'll have a sort of physics update in your game. Graphics updates as well, it's fairly simple stuff. I mean, I'm not saying this is complicated, it's just being aware of the components of a game. Um, so this is just, if you're using Canvas, this is where you'll sort of uh, redraw every element that you've got in your game and back onto the screen. Um, the networking, so if you're doing multiplayer, you're going to have sort of networking side of things. So you're going to, um, whether you're using WebSockets, um, if you're going for the sort of web-based stuff, you probably will be. Um, so it's just being aware of like these aspects of the game and how they're going to sort of integrate. And I think one of the most important things I found, at least with Rockets, is the controls in the UI. Um, it's particularly because it's sort of cross-platform, so you can play on the mobile, you can play on the PC. The same controls that work on a PC are not going to work on the mobile. Um, and I've, I've still not, I know what to do with it, but I've still not solved it on Rockets yet, but it's not going to be too complicated because with these technologies, you can um, use CSS or just JavaScript touchdown events, and it's kind of cool. So with Rockets, I, I hired a UI designer to do this for me, so it was a lot better than I could do. Um, but it, I think it adds a little bit more to a game. Um, a HTML5 game at the moment is still going to look fairly simple. It's not quite there yet for the, the high performance graphics and really sort of um, nicely rendered 3D stuff. It's going to hold my hands up. It's not ready for that yet. But if you're careful with your graphics and stuff like that and do it really nicely and, and optimize it, you're going to get a really nice looking game that is using the technologies that are available right now. So something interesting um, with the control side of things, um, you've probably seen it on iOS games if you've played them, where you sort of put your thumbs on either side and you've got like joysticks, um, but they're on the screen. Um, that's kind of cool. And a guy I know called Sebley Delisle um, implemented this in JavaScript just as he was mucking around and he just sort of wanted to see if it was possible. It was. Um, and it's a really cool way of adding an a iOS interface for your HTML5 game. So for example, in Rockets, with the rockets flying around, my left thumb could be moving the rocket around um, and my uh, right thumb could be shooting in certain directions. Um, on the PC, instead, you're either using the keyboard or mouse or whatever, and you're only having to change a very small amount of code, which is just your event listeners um, and a little bit of UI stuff. But the logic for shooting and moving is all the same. You're just changing the way that you interface with that. And it's really easy with these technologies. Um, so performance, I mean, this isn't like a, a fundamental feature of game like development. It's just something you need to be aware of along the whole process. Um, I sort of stumbled across this quite a lot, like you do too many loops or you just do stupid little things and you slow your game down so much. So you just need to be very careful. I mean, I'll run through a couple of tips for performance at the end. Um, so yeah, so I mean, you might be thinking, it's pretty crazy, I don't want to go through all this effort just to make a, a little game. You don't have to. Um, there are game engines around, so um, they sort of done all the hard bits for you, so you just concentrate on making the cool game. So it's like jQuery for game development. Um, it's the best way to look at it, I suppose. So I mean, there's one called um, Impact. Has anyone heard of Impact? Yeah, so Impact is a um, really interesting one. It's $99, um, which I used to think was expensive for game development, but I actually think is quite cheap now. Um, for what it does, it's one of the better ones. Um, the documentation is great for it. Uh, the developer's a really nice guy. He's active. Um, He's really helpful. You can jump on IRC and start talking to him. He's a really nice guy. Um, he'll just sort of support you with anything you want. Um, it doesn't support WebSockets and multiplayer stuff out of the box, but people, are, the community are sort of trying to um, build multiplayer sort of add-ons for it and stuff like that. So it's not got everything, um, but it's one of the better ones. That I definitely uh, would uh, sort of suggest looking into that one. Um, an open source free one um, is Crafty. Um, it's not my favorite. There's a few things I don't like about it. Um, but it's, it's free, and it's, it's doing better than some of the other free ones out there. And it, it's fairly fully featured. And you, can, you can make a nice game with it. There's no problem with that. You just pick the one that you sort of prefer to use, I suppose. Um, there's also Isogenic Engine. Um, this is one of the most promising ones out there that hasn't been sort of enveloped by a larger company yet. Um, so I'm hoping this stays public. 
I, I would, it would be a shame if this one got taken off as well. Um, this one has multiplayer built in um, for massively multiplayer as well. Uh, it uses Node on the server in MongoDB. Um, Canvas or DOM based graphics, it's isographic um, sort of 2.5D stuff or 2D scroller stuff, whatever. It, it does pretty much everything and it's powerful, but it comes at a price. Um, so it's a, I, I don't know the exact price, it's a few hundred pounds, so a few hundred dollars as well. I mean, it, it's, and it's still in beta at the moment. Um, <coughs> but if you get what you pay for, and it's a sort of it's not for a per game license. I think it's a, a one developer license kind of thing. So I don't know. I think I think paying for engines. I think people are going to have to get used to um, if you get the better quality stuff and if it's going to push stuff forward. Uh, I mean, it's the same in like um, sort of stuff like Unity. You have to pay for that, and it, you get a really nice um, tool to create games with. So the isogenic stuff. I mean, this is an, a demo of something he's been doing with it. This is. Um, Rob Evan, the, the creator of it, he's creating a thing called um, ISO City. It's like a Sim City kind of thing, and it's just a little demo using. Um, it's not using. I mean, even though it's really, it's not using WebGL. It's it's just two D graphics um, using Canvas, and it's just showing off the engine. It's just something quite interesting. I mean, he's got that working like fully HD resolution, like massively um, thousands of little players walking around. Loads of sprites all over the place. A, a multiplayer city editor kind of thing. And it's running really, really, really smoothly. Um, and this is the, one of the most promising things about this engine is it's one of the fastest. Um, but you don't have to use sort of full engines. There's like libraries and stuff, so you can sort of get components. So um, you might want to rewrite your whole game loop yourself and, and do the multiplayer networking stuff, but you might want, not want to do um, the graphic side of things. Well, there's, there's sort of libraries and stuff out there to sort of help you with that. So you can sort of, sort of um, pull in bits from other people. So one of these is the physics stuff I was talking about. There's one called Box2D, um, which is what Angry Birds uses on iOS, I believe. Um, there is a port for JavaScript called Box2D Web. Um, there is one actually called Box2D JS or something like that, but that one's fairly old. This one's the newest one. It's updated more often, so I think this is the most promising one to look at. Um, this just gives you a physics engine to just plug into your game and just do whatever you want with it. It's pretty cool. Um, for multiplayer stuff, there's a um, thing called Motion.js now. This is trying to solve, there's like, within multiplayer, there's, um, you get issues with lag, and you get you have to use things like client-side prediction. I'm not going to go into that, but what it basically means is um, you try and predict, you, you do stuff on the client side to, to mitigate the lag that's happening between the client and the server. Um, and it's a fairly complex side of, sort of game development, and most people probably don't want to even think about it. So, for example, Isogenic is doing this for you. You don't have to worry about it. But if you just want to have the multiplayer stuff there, but you've already created your own engine, you can use things like Motion.js. Now, it's not been fully developed yet, but it's um, a great idea, and I think it's something to keep an eye on. Maybe um, there'll be something else sort of replacing it, re providing the same functionality. But I just think the concept of being able to plug and play these, these parts of game development is going to be a really interesting part of the uh, HTML5 gaming. Um, so, like hosting all this stuff on your own server, you can do that if you want, or you could go sort of like cloud based. You can go with um, joint um, node servers. I think it's no.de, the actual URL. Um, so, this provides a sort of remote node server for you to use. You can use WebSockets with it. You can do whatever you want. It's really quick to sort of get something up and running. Um, there's a, a competition called Node Knockout, which um, gets loads of developers together to sort of screw around with Node.js, and that's where Word Squared came from, I believe. Um, I think. Anyway, there's developers get together, they make games, they make applications, whatever, and they used Node uh, joint Node servers last time, just because it, in 48 hours they just hacked something together, they set up the server without having to set it up. Really, they just signed in, and there it was. Um, you just push your code up with Git, and whatever you've got your, your game working multiplayer already. Um, scaling, all that kind of stuff. If you don't want a full server and you just want the communication stuff, so there's things like Pusher, which is like WebSocket sort of um, communication service. So you can sort of sign up to that. You don't have to worry about your WebSocket stuff. You just say, I want to send a message to the server. The server wants to send a message back to the client. You don't have to worry about that. Pusher does it for you. Um, and there's things like Cousing as well. Um, so sort of self-hosted, sort of web sockets communication platform. So it's not remotely hosted. You have it on your own server. But um, 
still pretty cool. So it does it all for you. Um, there's Electro Server, which is um, sort of a, another self-hosted platform. It does communication stuff, but it's not WebSockets. Um, it's more for like game logic, so you sort of run it. It's like a game server, I suppose. Um, the interesting thing about Electro Server is it doesn't just do JavaScript. It does a whole sort of variety of, um, of supports a whole variety of um, platforms. Um, so it's definitely something to look into. Um, Flash developers use this quite a lot. So throughout like the development, like when I was doing raw kits and just mucking around at university and stuff, there's a few key lessons that I've learned. I've sort of covered a couple. Um, so the most important ones are the sort of ones I'm going to go through now. So with, like I was saying with the game loops and the physics updates and the graphics updates, you need to cut down on your loops because they will screw up with your, um, your processor. Um, too many loops, you're just gonna, you'll notice straight away when you've done too many loops. So you just need to be um, frugal with, with what you're trying to do with your game. You need to be careful with how many objects you're looping through all the time. So if you don't need to loop through an object, don't loop through that one. Like you'll save small amounts of um, small sort of performance uh, increases, but it, it all adds up. Um, this is one of the main things I learned when I first developed. I was doing loops all over the place and it didn't work very well. I had like 30 little circles drawn on the screen and it was already slow. So you can actually get thousands um, if you do it properly. And sort of related to that is don't use um, JavaScript timers. Um, I still do in my game. Don't look at my code and use what I've done. The way to do it is to do request animation frame. Um, it's something kind of I want to implement. Um, I haven't had, had time to implement it. <laughs> um, it basically puts the browser in control of sort of the, the animation. So instead of saying every 30 seconds, I want you right now to sort of push this animation frame, just push it, push it, push it, push it. Request animation frame sort of said to the browser, I'm ready for a, a new frame now. And the browser, when it's ready, will say, OK, here you go, take it. Um, so it, it saves, uh, it's, sorry, not saves. It's good on performance. Um, people talk about how it saves battery on mobile phones. I have no idea if that's true, but um, I'm just gonna get onto that, how if, uh, if you're using a JavaScript timer and you sort of flick over to another tab, it could still keep running. Um, I think they're trying to look into sort of capping that, but before, I mean, you'd be, you'd be running something 30 frames a second in the background and it would just be screwing up with your processing, uh, processor usage and stuff like that. And it, it's just not very good. So with request animation frame, it sort of gets made inactive when it, it loses focus. Um, and then you, you can sort of pick up again afterwards when you come back into that tab. So it's just, like I said, it's little things. And this is probably one of the biggest ones at the moment. It's going to save so much effort on your behalf. And it's really easy to use. Um, I mean, it's not supported in, in every version of every browser, but um, a guy called Paul Irish from um, Google uh, has made a shim that allows you to sort of use the request animation API um, just in your game anyway, and it will just sort of fall back into the set timeout JavaScript timer stuff. So um, you don't have to worry about keeping two versions of your timings and stuff going. Um, some network tricks. I think this is probably the most interesting thing I've learned recently. This is with Rawkits, actually. I learned this, and I learned it very quickly, and I had to learn how to solve it very quickly. Because um, if you want to make a multiplayer game, you probably want more than two people playing it before it sort of gets really annoying. Um, so I mean, the concept is basically you need to be aware of how much data you're sending, and I wasn't. Um, so the way I do rockets is I send an update from the client from the player to the server. The server goes, okay, um, you want to move this way, okay, fine. Um, this is your new position. So with one player, it's one update going up to the server, one update going back down. Fairly simple. Two players, two updates going up, one from each player, um, two updates going back to each player. Um, so that's four updates in total going back, because um, it's obviously for each player, it's their update and the other person's update. Fine, two messages in, four messages out. So four players, um, you've now got four messages coming in, 16 messages going out. So sort of if you haven't noticed, the sort of messages are going, messages out are sort of the square of the messages in. Um, so you can see. 30 players, uh, 30 messages in, 900 messages out. So it's getting pretty mental already. I mean, think about this. This isn't just like one time data being sent. This is every frame it's, or every update on the server, at least, it's sending 900 updates. I mean, this is ridiculous. Um, 
but go further still. So you want to make a massively multiplayer game. You've got 100 players. Um, that's 10,000 messages out in one frame. It's ridiculous. So I got tripped up very quickly with this kind of stuff. And, and the way to sort of get around it is to, um, you can even make your game intelligent. So the good thing about using sort of, uh, you, well, you know the size of the browser um, on the client side. So you can, if your server knows like what the player can see, you know what they can't see. So if you, you know not to send them updates for the players that aren't affecting them in the game, that saves you so much, so many resources. Um, I use that in Rockets now because originally it was a fairly big um, world and you had players flying around the outside of the screen that you couldn't see. Um, that wasn't so much of a problem. It was a problem when each of those players fired about 20 bullets. You then had, say, 10 players and 20 bullets, you got 200 bullets. So, I think. Um, and if you've got 200 bullets flying around, what's that? 20,000 updates are happening. 40,000, 40, yeah. Cool. So this is why uh, I don't have a degree in maths. Um, <laughs> anyway, so you've got 40,000 updates. What I mean is, is a, big, a big number. So you need to be careful. And I mean, that crashed my game. It was ridiculous. So by the way I did it was any bullet or player that was not in your visible area, you didn't display it until they popped into your area or just a little bit outside. Um, the game was now playable again. It, it's simple little things, and it, you don't have to do too much to sort of get these performance gains out of the game. What happened with cheating the game? I mean, I think that kind of informs a lot of what I'm going to I'm going to get onto the cheating, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so next slide, cheaters. Um, so when I first started Rockets, um, the, the code is obviously available to anyone to see. And I was probably being a little bit too trustworthy with my code. Um, it was multiplayer. I was the, the player was sending updates to the client, uh, sorry, to the server. Um, instead of like saying, I want to move, um, and the server going, OK, I'm going to put you here. So that's called an authoritative server. Authoritative server. Um, I had a, an authoritative client, which means that the client sort of says, I'm here. And the server goes, OK. Um, so. I didn't think anyone was going to screw up with that. Um, turns out they did straight away. Uh, probably about five minutes after I released the game, um, people were flying around at like warp speed. They were had rapid fire bullets. They were they even made their own weapons, um, which I found fascinating. So some guy worked out how to. The only weapons that were in the game at the time were um, you just held down the space bar and it shot at a timed limit. So it was like every 300 milliseconds it would fire a new bullet. Um, but that 300 millisecond limit was on the client. So you change that to 30, you've got a machine gun. You change that to zero, you're going to crash the game, which happened quite a lot. Um, but people worked out that instead of waiting for the space bar to fire a bullet, they would just code their own um, sort of event handler, which would sort of do 20 bullet presses in one press and it would make a cluster bomb. So they would <laughs> press um, the space bar or, or C, whatever button they, they sort of linked it to. It would put 20 bullets in. It would change their velocities to come out at sort of random angles. And it would just destroy everyone in the game. <laughs> I found it hilarious, and it was great. And I'm going to put that into the game later. And it, um, but it was, I don't know, it, it wasn't such a bad thing. It was just a, an interesting thing that I noticed, because it was easy to fix. You make, um, you make your game sort of dumb. Um, on the client side, so um, it can update its own stuff, but the server basically has the full control and authority over what's going on. And, um, instead of the, the client going, the player going, hey, this is where I am right now, make sure I'm there on everyone else's computer, the, the client just goes, I want to move, um, you know where I am, can you tell me where I need to be now? Um, and that's kind of what you need to do. Um, and this is where, like I was saying before, you get client-side prediction. This stops it getting all laggy and stuff like that. I'm not going to get too much into the details. It's, it can get pretty complicated. Just be aware that it, your code's going to be open. So if you aren't sort of looking into these kinds of things, you might regret it. Um, so yeah, uh, the good thing about this, though, is that people were making, they were finding the errors in my game, which I found amazing. Um, I didn't have to pay them to do that. They were going in. They felt motivated enough to go in and try and break my game. Yeah, OK, they did it. Um, but I, I appreciated that. 
um, it showed me all the holes that I needed to plug and the next version of the game I plugged them and then they tried to do it again and if they did it again I fixed that um, it's free testing you can't get better than that and the fact because this isn't all compiled and stuff I was like sort of um, making changes like as soon as I saw someone hacking and I saw what they did I could make the change in a couple of seconds upload it to the server and it would be fixed I didn't have to do any compilation or anything like that it was just done restart the server it's working um, so it's really quite interesting and quite cool. Um, so although I hate cheaters, I also love them a little bit. So something I'm sort of looking into at the moment, um, so I've had a few conversations with people about this, um, is DOM or Canvas. So I'm sort of sitting on the Canvas side of things. Um, I know a few guys who are sort of sitting on the DOM side of things. I get both sides. And what I mean by this is so, um, on Canvas, you're using the, the HTML5 Canvas element to draw your graphics and stuff like that. So you're using this sort of pixel sort of blitting, I think they call it. Um, sort of just a grid of pixels, and you're just pushing pixels onto it. You're not, there's no, each element you draw doesn't have its own DOM element. There's no sort of sense of objects um, in Canvas. It's just a block of pixels. It doesn't know that that's a circle. It just knows that it, it's a bunch of pixels in that area. Um, with the DOM side of things, you're using normal content elements um, and stuff like that, putting image backgrounds in, whatever. Um, it's, I don't know, it's, in my opinion, DOM has um, more performance benefits, I suppose. Um, but Canvas, I think, is the right tool for the future. I don't think it's particularly ready to replace the way the, what the DOM works at the moment because there's still some issues with Canvas performance. It's going to get better um, with harder acceleration and, and better updates. I mean, people are doing stuff with Canvas that it wasn't built to do. Let's put it that way. So we're trying to sort of catch up with it, I think. Um, but I mean, sorry, did you have a question? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's loads of different ways to sort of get around it. It's, it's quite interesting to see the ways people are trying to squeeze the performance out of stuff like that. Um, so I mean, I did use multiple canvases for the original raw pits and probably will with the new one. Um, so the background I used a separate canvas and the the guy the raw pits rule on another canvas. So I wasn't constantly having to redraw the entire background every time. Saved so much like so many resources, so much resource is. Um, but I mean the whole DOM versus canvas thing kind of reminds me of like the, the way tables were used to do layout back in the day instead of before CSS came along and sort of saved everyone. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree that there isn't a, an either or situation at the moment. It's there is sort of context to what one you're going to choose. Um, I just, I think the kind of argument I'm getting at here is is more that I think we should be concentrating on fixing Canvas, the, the issues that, that we have with Canvas. So whether that's um, the accessibility, so the fact that Canvas doesn't know what's being drawn on it. Um, so the interaction layers and stuff like that, there's, there's no, you have to code your own. You, you can't just click on a canvas and know where you've clicked and what you've clicked on. You have to make that all yourself. Um, this is the kind of stuff that DOM's really good at. Um, now, I don't know, I mean, whether I want to replace the DOM with canvas, I haven't quite decided yet. I haven't, my thoughts on this haven't really matured yet. Um, I just think it's something we need to be thinking about because I think you've got a really good reason for why you're using that kind of technology. I think a lot of people are just using them because they're there. So the reason why I say that is um, a lot of game engines are giving either just DOM support or DOM and Canvas support. But the developers who are using those engines don't know the difference. They don't, they're just using the DOM because it was the default version. Um, I think it's more of an education thing that I'm getting at here. It's, it's not necessarily replacing them yet, at least until Canvas is not ready to replace the DOM as we've, as we've agreed on. But I mean, yeah, it's a performance thing. So if you want to be sort of supporting like older browsers, you're not going to be able to use stuff like the Canvas because it's just not going to be fast enough. Um, but we need to be making sure that we're going in the right direction for the future. Now, my concern is if we keep sort of holding on to the DOM, we're going to be holding back on what we could be doing with the Canvas kind of stuff. This is why I haven't quite decided if, I, if I'm just Canvas or just DOM yet. I, I, I just think we need to be careful and really think about what we're trying to do here. Um, so anyway, the sort of besides the point, I just thought it was quite interesting to get out. So 
the future of sort of HTML5 gaming, I think, is quite interesting. And I think, like we've already agreed with that discussion as well, is we're kind of at an early stage with stuff like Canvas, with WebSockets, and particularly because WebSockets sort of has had a bit of a rocky uh, uh, sort of journey recently. Um, but there's some quite interesting things that sort of need to be done, and if they are done, I think it's going to be really interesting to see um, the improvements that are going to be made with HTML5 gaming. So one of the most important is better documentation, so more tutorials about this kind of stuff, um, especially the complex areas, like I was saying, like client-side prediction, the multiplayer stuff that people might want to add to their game, but they might not want to um, have to research and, and understand the theory all themselves. So, there's a, um, a really good gaming resource called Gaffron Games. I don't know if has anyone heard of that. Um, There's a guy called Glenn, Glenn Fiedler. I, I don't know how to pronounce his name. It's probably, it's probably fairly simple. Um, but it's a really good sort of resource for desktop gaming um, sort of languages. And it's where I learned how to do client side prediction, all that kind of stuff. But you have to port from the languages he's using over to JavaScript, and that kind of doesn't work sometimes, and it's a bit annoying and if you're just a developer that just wants to make a game quickly and understand the technologies it's not ideal so we need stuff a resource a repository or something just better documentation for making particular aspects of gaming in javascript um, it's kind of bits and bobs all over the place there's bits like questions on stack overflow and the game dev stack overflow and stuff but i don't know it's, it's not quite there yet um, and i think that's really going to help people and push things forward if we can sort of get that kind of thing and um, something i want to kind of work on as well myself. Um, the other thing is WebGL support. It's really bad at the moment, um, particularly with the IE stuff and whatever. Um, the WebGL is interesting because it's, it's massively hardware accelerated. So there's like WebGL, there's a 2D version of WebGL, which is what uh, the web version of Angry Birds uses. Um, so it's like sort of hardware accelerated 2D stuff. It's quite interesting. Um, if WebGL gets better, I think we're going to see some much more much cooler games coming out. Um, I think when the cooler games come out, I think that's when more people are going to get involved. It's sort of like a, a, roll, a ball rolling down a hill effect. Um, yes. So yeah, I mean, aside from WebGL, I think we need more engines as well, more gaming engines, more, more robust engines, more mature engines, um, that solve the issues, the complicated issues for us. So a bit like Isogenic, if that comes up and comes off really well, that'd be great. Um, the price might be a concern, but we that can be worked out in the future. Um, I worry that a lot of these engines are just being snapped up by the big companies. I think that's a really bad thing. Um, I, I just want a really nice one that is ready for the public and that can be used. If we can have that, I think we're going to see some really cool games and, and a much brighter future um, for HTML5 gaming. Um, improved audio, like I was saying, this, the, the loop stuff is crap at the moment. So, <laughs> nodding your head. <laughs> um, I think if we can get improved HTML5 audio support and more consistent, at least, HTML5 audio support um, with proper looping, that would be amazing. Um, we can just, I could drop Flash completely then from my game. Um, more powerful mobile devices, I mean, we're getting that now, like every time, it's sort of whatever, it's upgrading the power and you're getting more out of it. I don't know how much exactly, but I think with more um, hardware accelerated stuff like Canvas and WebGL on, on mobile devices and stuff, it's, it's going to be a lot easier to make some quite interesting games and perhaps if we use the DOM for the moment or whatever, but being or sort of pushing the power of the mobile stuff, I think that's where a lot of games are getting um, being played right now is on mobile devices and we're ready to be going there. Yeah. So yeah, multi-touch support. Um, JavaScript, well iOS at least, um, has full multi-touch support in JavaScript. So I haven't dabbled too much in Android yet. Um, and I we're looking into it for Firefox. Um, we, I think we're going to start with just single touch support and then we'll move into multi-touch. But it's there and it's in JavaScript, so it's it's usable. Um, so I mean, if you really wanted to, you could support 10 fingers. I think it's actually 11 fingers. It's, I, I don't know why it's 11 fingers. <laughs> I don't know, we, we're trying this out. Um, I was at another event and uh, Sebley Delisle was showing his sort of controller thing and, and he put all 10 fingers on and I was like, just put another finger on and it just worked. So, but we couldn't put any more on, so I don't know why there's a limit of 11. I think Samsung supports 20 touch. 20? For two people? Yeah. That'll be interesting. On one device. 
Twister. <laughs> Twister. You can assume it, so it's single, it's single for like 90% of the existing phones on Android. Pardon? It's, it's, well, majority of Android phones have single touch support. Only. It's only single? Yeah, you get the single event, but you just don't get any more of them. That's interesting. So Android's sort of single touch support, and majority of them, well, did you we, say? we ran into it because we're trying to create virtual buttons. So right. push one than the other. This one, this one will just get ignored. It, like, it just didn't go. Yeah. It didn't realize you can you know, touch the buttons at once. Yeah, so I mean, that would be interesting to sort of get more consistent. I think there's um, a spec coming out for touch-based events. It's for a legal thing. I mean, everybody wants it to be consistent, but right. you know, Apple's sort of like, we entered this. You yeah. Know, <laughs> Even though it's just touching a screen. <laughs> I just want to make cool games. <laughs> um, so another thing kind of related to that is, again, crappy font. It's not better, it's better controls. Um, so more sort of like console-like control systems. Um, sorry, like what <laughs> Sebley Delilah's done with the iOS stuff, with the, the joysticks, um, and sort of what, what's going on here um, with the, the brass monkey stuff, um, which used to be sort of, well, the Emotely stuff was the kind of stuff I'm interested in here. Um, it's turning smartphones, particularly, is it just iOS at the moment? Uh, iOS, Android, we've got, we've got everything, actually. Okay, so smartphones, turning them into controllers. Um, but not just controllers, you can change the interface of the controller is it just using HTML and stuff, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so it's, it's basically we're running, it's sort of using Chrome app right now, so you take, yeah, you can make a web app that runs your phone that can control something else. Yeah, so I mean, one example is um, you had a, a Super Mario game, and you had the controller looking like an old, was it? Um, yeah, NES. Yeah, yeah, NES system controller on your phone, and you were just, it just looked cool. Um, but if you use a different game, the control system would completely change, so you might have the two joysticks on it. Um, but you're not having to do anything that much more complicated. You're just using the API that exists, right? Yeah. So I mean, this kind of stuff is cool and it's interesting, and it sort of breaks away from the keyboard on the mouse, even though you're playing on the browser or on your telly or wherever. Um, I think the way people interfa interact with these games is going to be quite interesting to see how how that develops um, in the future. Monetization. I said that completely wrong. Monetization, whatever, is a massive issue right now. If, if there's no money involved in this industry, there's people aren't just going to make the games for it. It's, it's just going to be the developers making demos and the cool stuff. Um, so right now, there aren't many games making profit. I don't know if there's probably, well, I mean, the Zynga stuff. I, I don't know what Zynga games support HTML5 yet. Um, I'm sure they'll make a crap load of money when they do um, release that. But there's no system for normal developers out there to make money from these games with these open technologies. And I think this is a massive stumbling block for the future, like if there's no money, they're just not going to make the games on this platform. They're going to go to where the money is, which is iOS or whatever. Um, so the kind of questions we need to answer, and I don't have the answer yet, but how do you monetize a game when the code is all open to use? So do you do um, sort of in-app purchases, and how do you do that without sort of people coding their own purchases and or stealing them or rewriting their own features to the game or whatever? You need to it needs to be thought about, and I think there's something there that um, needs to be looked into and, and someone can make a lot of money out of that. So I'm Rob Hawks. Um, that's my Twitter, at Rob Hawks. Um, Rawks.com is my blog if you want to find out more about this kind of stuff. Um, some interesting projects I've worked on recently is Twitter sentiment analysis was um, for my dissertation at uni. That was really kind of cool. Um, sort of do a, a podcast called Explicit Web. Um, or web development stuff, we talk about this kind of crazy stuff. Um, got a book, we're going to give a couple away today um, on sort of HTML5 Canvas. A little bit about gaming at the end as well, we make two games at the end. It's all about sort of getting to grips with Canvas from scratch. So, I mean, if, if you know a little bit about Canvas, this probably isn't your book, but if you don't know too much, you know of it, but you don't know how to use it, you haven't really used it yet, you want to sort of find it about all the features, it's definitely the kind of book for you. Um, it sort of gives you a, an overview of JavaScript as well. So if you need to JavaScript, absolutely fine. Um, so yeah, that's out on, um, it's in Amazon. You can go on my website, rooks.com slash foundation canvas. So you can get it there if you want. Um, there's another thing is um, Coffee Ford, which is um, a Mozilla event that's happening this Friday um, at the Red Rock Cafe in Mountain View. So this is um, this new Mozilla project called Web Ford. Um, it's like, they call it a, uh, an innovation accelerator. So it's all about sort of grabbing these open source projects, uh, these open projects, and pushing pushing the web forward together. So getting Mozilla involved. Um, you might know more about this than I do. But. Photos of 
Y Combinator for open web technology projects. There you go. So Y Combinator for open web technology stuff. Sorry. On Friday, uh, I don't know the actual time. Do you know the time? Um, I think it's in the, in the morning, like 10 o'clock or something. Let me check it. Let me check okay, it. so yeah, so it's on Friday. We'll find out the time in a second. Um, so it's just an excuse like on Friday just to meet a few great people. Um, it's in Mountain View, so it's, it's fairly local. It's local for you guys, not for me. I live in the UK. But 9.30 to 11.30. 9.30 to 11.30 um, on Friday. Um, yeah. AM, yes. Yeah, good clarification point. Um, so yeah, that'll be interesting. <laughs> so uh, definitely go to that. Um, there's also Mozilla Dev, Dev Derby, which is something we've been running. Um, did one last month. Um, it's running every month now. So this month is um, HTML5 video. So it's a competition where you can upload sort of demonstrations or um, experiments or whatever that you've made with these technologies. So, so I don't know. You could. Um, Pick a HTML5 video element, you can manipulate it with the canvas, do something really cool with that and upload that demo. Um, if you win, um, you can get prizes like Android phones, bags, um, t-shirts and that kind of stuff. Um, so next month is all about touch events, um, which is going to be interesting. Um, and then the month after that is the history API, I think. I'm not quite sure yet. Okay, it says on the website, but <laughs> either way, it's a good thing to keep an eye on. Um, cool competition. I think you should definitely submit something if you're interested in these technologies. The link is down there. It's also screwed up a little bit. Um, but it, I mean, if you search Dev Derby Mozilla on Google, you'll, you'll find it. Um, so yeah, so thanks for listening. Um, hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Um, I believe we have some time set aside for questions. I don't know if we overlapped a bit or got questions. Cool. So, but yeah, so the question was sort of who's going to be making the big impact with the, the monetization side of HTML5 gaming. So whether that's the Chrome Web Store or um, uh, iOS App Store. Um, I don't really know. I mean, my gut would say the Web Store stuff is quite interesting. Um, but I mean, it's not, there's nothing stopping you from using that game for free. Um, the way I can see it is the monetization side is going to be stuff that you can put on the server that you sort of push back down to the client. So whether that's in-app purchases where someone, regardless of the, the system where the money comes from, whether that's the app store or um, web stores or whatever, or your own um, PayPal, anything. As long as you can keep control of what's going on on the server, they can't see that code. Unless If they can see that code, then you've got a bigger problem. Um, then push the stuff back down. How you stop that re regarding sharing of that content, I don't know yet. Um, it's going to be interesting. Um, I don't have an answer to it yet. So, so that's a valid point. It's um, using things like PhoneGap. You can package up the um, HTML5 games and whatever into an app on iOS, put it on the App Store as an iOS app, and sell it that way. Um, so you won't necessarily be accessing it through the browser, but you'll be accessing it through the WebKit stuff on iOS through the app. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, there's ways of, of getting around this kind of stuff. It's just there's no way to do it cross-platform or on the web, particularly. Um, so yeah, isometric games, where do you start? Um, this is why I like the isogenic engine, because I think it's um, it's one of the, I don't, I don't believe it's the only, but it's, it's one of the most promising ones that's really sort of pushing for the iso isometric um, gameplay kind of stuff, the whole Farmville look and whatever. Um, the, the engine that I would recommend is isogenic engine. Um, the fact that it's not out in the public properly, I mean, you can buy it and use it, but it's still being developed. Um, that's kind of the best answer I can give in that re regard. I've not tried any of the other engines, so I don't know. Um, whether you create an engine yourself, I don't know. It, don't, it depends if that's uh, something you want to do, but Isogenic is probably the one to keep an eye on in, in regard for iso isographic gaming. Um, and the web, the, sorry, the game closure? I've not actually looked into that yet, so it'll be interesting to look into. Right, yeah, so the, the question is um, with Rockets and any, any other multiplayer game, if you go on at, say, 3 in the morning and there's no one there, it's going to be a pretty boring game. So um, I have run into that problem, um, particularly because there's a, a small but sort of, um, sort of uh, 
addicted group of people that play the game, but if they're not on, then they, there's no one to play. So the way I was looking at it is I'm going to introduce things like bots, like so you can just sort of you have AI running around in the game. It's, it's going to be multiplayer, but you could play it single player, except you still get the multiplayer aspects of the game, um, that it's not human. Um, Mechanical Turk. Yeah, so you get <laughs> higher people to, to come in and play. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> if you've got money to burn, go for it. Um, but yes, yeah, so, I mean, it is a problem. And, and I think but that's not a gaming, HTML5 gaming problem. It's a gaming problem in general. Um, it, I've, and that is building up communities. And then that, so building up a community of players for your game. And then that boils back to the whole, where do you advertise these games? Do you go on Congregate? Do you go on, um, put it on Facebook? Do you put it in the App Store, whatever? If you're not going where the players are, you're not going to get many players and it's not going to be a fun game. So you've got to balance it all out. Um, I haven't got an ideal solution, but the bots, the AI, is, is my way of fixing it, temporarily at least. Cool. Any more questions? Cool, thank you.